Well, welcome to you all. You see that I'm presenting. Um, this day we're going to talk about writing and establishing objectives, specifically behavioral objectives, and we'll start talking a little bit about where that fits into the curriculum model and how you can utilize those. Um, this is one of those things when you start talking about writing objectives and establishing objectives, people's eyes blaze over. Uh, this is one of those things that, that people just don't understand, folks don't understand the value of this. But when these are done correctly, it really does help align your curriculum. It helps put things into perspective. It lets you know what is necessary. It lets the program know what's necessary and what everybody's doing. And it lets the students know. So this can be a very, very positive thing. Um, you should be seeing in a minute. Okay. Is everybody seeing the presentation? Okay. Let's go through this a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about writing behavioral objectives and what this means, where this fits, and how this is, is all done. It's really not a difficult thing to write behavioral objectives, and they're different than objectives in general or goals. And we're going to talk about where those things kind of fit. Um, the big question is, where do objectives fit within the instructional design process? And if you think about this, this is what you're doing. Every time you design a new course or change a course or change a program or even as simple as changing a lesson that you do, objectives fit into this process. So let's kind of take a look at this. The first thing that happens is we establish, and you have done this, and Petros has sent those to me, uh, you've taken a look at the overall program level goals. In other words, what is it that you want this PhD to entail? In other words, a student who leaves your program after X number of years, after they have completed everything and after they graduate, you have established a set of program goals. In other words, what is it that the student is going to learn when they walk out? What do they know? What can they do? You know, what are they able to apply? And those are what you spend an inordinate amount of time developing as a faculty. The second thing that you do is you then break those down and you establish course level objectives. And this is a relatively simple thing to do if you start with the program level goals, which are the, the 10,000 foot view. Then you move down to the 5,000 foot view, which is okay. Each one of the courses that we have, if we have 15 courses, each one of these courses are going to address some of these program level goals. So you can start mapping to those. So it becomes a very simple thing. You list out all of your program goals down one side of a, a spreadsheet, and then you list the courses along the top, and you just put checks in there as to which course is going to address which goals. Now, you may have some redundancy. You may have some overlap, and that's not a bad thing. But that's what that mapping process is all about, is aligning your overall program level goals with your course level objectives. So it sounds like a simple thing, and it actually really is when you sit down and look at it. This is not rocket science. You know your objectives. You know what you have. You know what your program is, and in all honesty, you know what your students need. Putting this down in curriculum format with an overall program level goal and then breaking it down into course level objectives begins to organize this in a way that everybody can see it. And if you think about this, every one of you are experts in your own specific courses. You know what those courses are, you know what those students need to learn, and you know your subject matter. It's a matter of communicating when you map this through an overall program level goal and course level goals, that communicates this to everybody. So that all faculty, all administrators, all program, everybody in the university understands what it is that your program is doing and how and where it's being done. Fairly simple to do, if you really think about it, because you know this. It's just putting it in an organizational format. After you have established course level goals, now this is where you as individual instructors begin to break this down into what we call behavioral objectives. Now the behavioral objectives are a finite view. In other words, if, you, if the overall program level goals are the 10,000 foot view and the course level objectives are the 5,000 foot view, the behavioral objectives are about the five foot view. 
you're right there. And each one of these objectives that you're going to do is based upon those course level objectives. And you're now just kind of finalizing that. You're finite bringing those down into structure. And these are what are going to develop your instructional strategies. When you have behavioral objectives, you're getting very, very specific. You may have for any one of a any one lesson, and I'm talking, in other words, if you have an eight-week course or you're running a 15-week course, each lesson within your course, in other words, each time you meet the students, you're going to have some very, very specific things that you wish to accomplish, some specific goals. Think of your behavioral objectives as what you want the student to be like when they leave that class. What do you want them to have learned when they walk out of that particular class? Now, we say the same thing. Overall program level goals, we want to know what the student is going to be able to know and do when they leave our program. Course level objectives, what is the student going to be able to know and do when they leave our course? The behavioral objectives get more finite and drill that down to each specific lesson within that course. So this kind of frames the whole process. So with the behavioral objectives, those behavioral objectives now drive the instructional strategies that we use. You know, whether that happens to be in a face-to-face -face setting or a synchronous setting or an asynchronous setting, they will drive the instructional strategies that we do. In other words, we want the student to be able to do this. So we look logically at the behavioral objectives and say, okay, in order to accomplish this, my students have to be able to do this. So this is the best way to teach them to do it. Now, interestingly, if you have two faculty who have the exact same uh, subject matter expertise and you have that knowledge, you give them a set of behavioral objectives. Say, okay, we have to accomplish these objectives. Two instructors may or may not do them the exact same way. Someone may say, well, we're going to do a lecture and that would be the best way to do this. Somebody's going to say, well, I'm going to give them a project and have them learn it this way. Or I'm going to have them read something and do this. You will all approach things in a slightly different way but you can meet those objectives in the same way. So that becomes your goal. Those behavioral objectives really are the driving force for a lot of things. When they are done correctly, they make the rest of your planning a very easy thing to do. It just falls out logically and you go, well, sure, that just is a logical thing. By the same way that when we write research questions for any kind of a research project that you're doing, the research questions, if they are worded correctly, they're worded properly, tell you exactly how you're going to conduct your research. Behavioral objectives do the exact same thing. If they're worded correctly, if they're stated correctly and they're specific, they will drive your instructional strategies in such a way that just, just logically falls out and you know exactly what needs to be done. Now, what's interesting is those instructional strategies and those behavioral objectives will lead also to your assessments. So think about this. Behavioral objectives are really the cornerstone of any lesson. They're the drill down point if you want to think of it that way. They lead to logically showing you what your instructional strategies are, but they will also drive and tell you what your assessments are. In other words, how are you going to formatively and summatively assess your students to decide did they meet those behavioral objectives? So think of it, it's a very, very circular process and the, those behavioral objectives, literally the cornerstone for teaching, but also assessing. So you write your behavioral objectives. From there, you establish your instructional strategies. At the same time, you can also write your assessments and then those assessments help you to know, did you meet your behavioral objectives? The assessments, theoretically, can be written even before you teach because you're writing those based upon your behavioral objectives, whether you're writing a test, whether you're developing a project. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about is how you, how you assess projects and performance-based objectives. Um, we'll talk about that next week. But this, in essence, is the curriculum design process. You establish the program level goals. You meet course level objectives. You align those. And then you drill down to the behavioral objectives, which then drive your instructional strategies. They also drive your assessments to tell us, did we meet our behavioral objectives? This is the curriculum design process. This is the instructional systems design process that you look at. Questions about this?
Okay, pretty logical, pretty straightforward, I think. Let's talk about writing behavioral objectives. When we write behavioral objectives, we have to think of them <clears throat> within the three domains of learning. This is Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Bloom's taxonomy first started back in, he started writing this back in 1956, and he started with the cognitive domain. Now, the cognitive domain works with the idea that objectives emphasize simple recall to very complex synthesized uh, ideas. It is the formation of knowledge is basically what it is. So we're looking at concepts here. The cognitive domain is just basically knowledge. Now, he wrote that back in 1956, and that was where he first came up with the first domain. Sometime later in the 60s, he realized that the cognitive domain didn't address everything that needed to be learned and done. So somewhere in the early 60s, he came up with a psychomotor domain, which is really skills level based, if you want to think about it. Think about that. These are objectives that emphasize manipulation, control of objects, and principally, he said, through motor control. But I would also argue that what we have found of recent is that the psychomotor is not just dealing with physical skills, I think there are also mental skills. Think of the mental skills that you are having students conduct in classes. Not just knowledge, it's mental skills. They know how to move. If you're an accounting teacher, you have to be able to know how to move numbers through a series of books and what those numbers mean. That's a, that's a mental skill. I would argue that math is not so much manipulation and control of objects as it is manipulation and control of numbers, which again becomes a mental skill. I think there are things within your program, computer uh, applications, you know, writing programming. Um, yeah, you could argue there's some level of physicality associated with that when you're manipulating things on a computer, but I also think that there's a fair amount of mental skill with being able to do those kind of things. The third domain that he came up with later was what is called the effective domain. Now, the objects within this domain emphasize things like emotional feelings and attitudes, um, and allow the student to understand why they are learning certain things and where this is of value. So it's almost seen as what's of value in that. So if you look at these different areas here, you've got, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got evaluation, synthesis, you've got cognitive, psychomotor, and effective domains, and each one of these have different levels that fall into play, okay? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about those as we kind of move here. So let's start with the cognitive domain. If you want to follow on with me, if you've opened up that other Bloom's taxonomy, it has some information, and I kind of like this. It's an older handout, uh, but it does kind of show some different things that you can kind of see with this that uh, kind of break it down, and will show you some different measurable words. So I'm going to escape out of this and load this up real quick. Okay, is everybody seeing that? Okay, you see the cognitive domain? Okay. If we take a look at the cognitive domain, the cognitive domain is knowledge-based. Okay, it is specifically dealing with knowledge. And you'll notice that this is hierarchical nature. You have knowledge, you have comprehension, you have application, you have analysis, you have synthesis, and ultimately evaluation. Now, these are on a continuum, if you would. And what Bloom tells us is to break down the knowledge, knowledge terms or knowledge objectives, this is the cognitive domain that generally requires memorization. Think about this. You have certain concepts within any one of your programs, within any one of your classes, that they just have to simply memorize. There's terminology. Think of the foundational classes that you teach within your program. There are some basic foundation type things that students need to learn. So a lot of times this is just simple rote memorization that they're doing. So if you look at the knowledge terms that you would use, and it's on the handout, you use things like identify, define, list, name, or recognize. And these are things that you want the student to do. Example might be the student will be able to identify the correct utilization of something, or the student will be able to identify uh, you know, five key concepts of computer science. Uh, they will be able to define the term Java uh, or any one of a number of other things that you would have them do. 
So this is just a list of measurable words, and that becomes important here as we kind of move forward a little bit and you kind of understand where we're going with that. The next level on Bloom's taxonomy with the cognitive domain is comprehension. This is a little bit more involved. This is where the student begins to interpret the information and they start to have the ability to understand and put meaning behind what those terms mean or what they're learning. So it's a little higher order thinking. The next level is the application. This is where the students are applying the knowledge. In other words, where do they see this fitting? So if you just give them a list of terms and words and you ask them to memorize them, what's the big problem with that? What's the problem for you? If I ask you to memorize a list of words, what's the big problem there? They have no meaning. You have no context or meaning to, toward anything. If you That's just correct. memorize the words, you have no <clears throat> meaning or context. Yeah, you have no understanding of why I'm learning this. You know, you're memorizing things. I think the nursing and health programs have problem with a course that they call anatomy and physiology simply because it is nothing more than a series of rote memorizations of muscles, nerves, bones, blood vessels, you know, organs. And students are memorizing those things without the understanding of where they're going to apply. Now, that's a foundational course because they need to have that knowledge for everything else they're doing. So when they get into assessing patients and they get into you know, different parts of the bodies that go wrong and illnesses and, and all those kind of things, they have to understand that. But when you're sitting there learning anatomy and physiology and simply rote memorizing things, it becomes a very difficult thing to do. So this is where Bloom starts to talk about the fact that we need to move this forward up the continuum. Yes, memorizing those knowledge terms is very, very important. But the ability to comprehend and understand what they are and then to begin to apply them uh, is very important as far as internalizing those things. Then we move up to what, and basically those three, knowledge, comprehension, application, and if you look at that handout, there's all kinds of measurable words, and those are important in the next couple of things we'll be talking about. But those three, knowledge, comprehension, and application, these are all lower order thinking skills. Okay? That does not mean that they are not important. Okay? They are important, but they're lower order. The higher order thinking starts to get in play when we start to analyze we start to synthesize, and we start to evaluate. So let's talk. What's the difference between analysis and synthesis? When you analyze something, what are you doing? When you analyze, you're taking it apart and looking at all the pieces. And when you synthesize, you're putting it back together in a new form. Absolutely. And that is a perfect definition, Donna. Thank you. Analysis of something is breaking a whole into its parts. In other words, you're taking the whole big thing and breaking that down for the student. The synthesis is where you take those parts and you build something anew. It's exactly what Donna said, and that is perfect. Those are higher order thinking skills. That's where you get into really breaking things down, and now they start to work with it, and this is higher order thinking. You've got different terms there under analysis, distinguish, uh, outline, identify, discriminate. You know, these are higher order thinking skills and those are the terms that you use. The synthesis is design, organize, formulate. It's where you're taking those things and applying them in a new venue. So students are having to use higher order thinking and that kind of goes outside the box. The last term that he talks about is the evaluation of terms. Now, the evaluation deals with examining, evaluate, judging, comparing, contrasting, critiquing. It is, it is considered, in his original work, the highest order thinking. Now, I say original work because in 2001, there was, for lack of a better term, a conclave of educators that got together and decided that Bloom's taxonomy had become such a large part of curriculum and curriculum design, and they felt that it hadn't been looked at in over 50 years, 40, 50 years, they decided that they were going to get together and reevaluate and modify this to make it more updated. And basically what they did is they just didn't find any change. I mean, the changes that they did, uh, they made synthesis, they moved synthesis as the higher order term and evaluate, and they changed the terminology around. But in all honesty, it never caught on. You know, the original Bloom's taxonomy is still being utilized today. 
um, and it is still acceptable. If you wanted to use the new one, you know, I've got the book in my office and what they did, but I'm not sure that it was any drastic change. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we kind of move forward. Um, Rick, could I ask a question? Um, is that new change, is that the one that goes to a higher level than evaluation, gets into creativity? Yeah, that's the one that they look at. And some people buy into that, some people don't. I can look at this and say that the evaluation term does just the same thing if you want to. Um, it's just a matter of style, Fred, and I'm not sure in the total scheme of things it makes a difference which one you use one way or the other. Um, it's more personal choice. I choose to use the older one, one, because I'm more familiar with it, and two, because I'm not really sure that they made any drastic changes that were life-sustaining or that people bought into. Um, so, yeah, that was the version, I think, that you may have seen. I think Larry had spoken about this a while back on some things. Um, okay, let's move on to the psychomotor domain. In the later, in the early 60s, he came in to realize that the cognitive domain just didn't address all areas that of all concepts that were being learned. And when you move into the psychomotor domain, this is a little different. It's again hierarchical, as is the cognitive domain, but it's hierarchical in a different way. Think about this. You've got, when you learn a new skill, I want you to think about this. Think back to the days when you have learned some new skill. Think back to the days when you learned how to drive. Now, think of you when you were 16 years old learning how to drive, because that's a big skill, and think of you now as a driver. What's the difference? What's the big difference between you as a driver now and you as a driver then? I would probably argue that you are all naturalized. Think about it. And not that any of us have done it of recent, but when you get in your car and you drive someplace, do you think of every step that you're doing? Okay, I got to put the car in gear. I got to turn the wheel. I got to put the turn signal on, take the brake off. Put... You don't think about those things. Those are just things that are naturally done. If you thought about how you got from point A to point B, you couldn't remember every step that you did because you're naturalized within that. I think back to when I taught my daughter how to drive. <clears throat> I remember the first time I got in a car and uh, was driving with her and I came back home and my wife says to me, she says, well, how did it go? And I said, well, I said, I one thing good. I said, we don't need to go to church on Sunday because we saw Jesus about two, three times. Um, the problem was at that time, my daughter was not naturalized. And think about this. What happens when you learn a new skill is you start by imitating what you have seen other people do and you watch closely what they've done. That's what she was doing. She was imitating what she had seen done, and that's the lowest level. Then you start working with each one of those skills, and you start, in other words, the ability to turn the wheel and then bring it back, in other words, when recover. Uh, the ability to brake without throwing people through the, through the front windshield. You, know, you learn how to manipulate, and you develop a certain level of precision that moves with that. So there is a process that you go through to get to that naturalization that we are all at. I would probably argue that when we all took our driving test, we weren't naturalized. We probably had a certain level of precision that allowed us to get through that. But then once we got through our test, we now get out into the, and we start driving on our own. And now we become naturalized over a period of time where we're applying that in ourselves. I uh, remember when I taught my son, I taught him, he passed his driver's test and I hadn't been in the car with him for about three months, but he had been out driving. And one day I said, Hey, drive me down to the store, or drive me. I got in the car with him and I was amazed at how much better a driver he was in three month period of time because he had taken those things out and he had worked with them. So you work with the idea of imitation. Initially, you work to imitate or manipulate the skills where you start to develop things a little better you get a certain level of precision and then you start to articulate things where everything starts to come together because a lot of times skills are not learned in isolation there's a series of skills that you're learning so you're putting those things together in a way that now you are they're understandable they're logical and everything kind of fits together with a certain level of proficiency ultimately getting to that naturalization. I would probably argue, I can't think of any skills that we are all teaching where somebody coming out of one of our courses or even out of our programs are naturalized within that. 
um, you know, in, in our program, in your program, you have dissertations and they're doing research. And research is a skill that we are teaching them. In some ways, it's physical. In other ways, it's a mental skill. But nonetheless, they are still developing that skill. And I would probably argue that when they have completed their dissertations, that they're not naturalized in the research process, but they have a certain level of precision and they start to see and start to work into that articulation area that now we send them out with the basic skills to eventually become naturalized. They need to get and have the training wheels taken off, if you want to use another analogy, and I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, but this is basically what the psychomotor domain is all about. The next level domain is something that's a little more involved, and it's a little nebulous for people to wrap their head around. And this is the effective domain. The effective domain really works with the concept of how do we value certain things. How do we get our students to value and see the value in what we are teaching them? Because think about this a second. If you don't see value in what you're learning, what happens? Or what doesn't happen? Not important to you. It has no meaning to you. You really don't care about it. That's right. So what do you do? You it, right? If, if Rick, when you start out, I can't figure out why I need to know it. I probably am doing my shopping list rather than paying very close attention to what you're sharing. Bingo. And this is exactly what our students do. If they don't see the value in what you are teaching them, then they're less likely to learn. Oh, they may memorize it just to get through your course and to get a, you know, to get the grade. But if they don't see the value, they're not going to internalize this. They're not going to apply that skill. They're not going to remember that knowledge, and they're not going to see where it all applies. This is in part what Bloom was attempting to address with the evaluation process that he put in into the cognitive domain. But he realized later on within the research and what he did that this just wasn't enough to address it, that we needed to build in objectives that were specifically designed to help students to value and to understand where this was going to apply within their life. So we kind of need to address that some way. You know, when you're standing in front of a class and you're teaching them things and you're posting things online, you know, you need to build in the concept of where are they going to use this and why is this of value to them? So think of the effective domain in that way. So basically without the effective domain, the cognitive and the psychomotor domain aren't going to be as effective. You know, the students aren't going to apply it. They're not going to internalize it. And that's the goal. One of the greatest fears I've had has been the fact that students will take a test from me. And I'll be honest with you, I don't give a lot of tests these days. In fact, I don't give any tests in any of the courses I'm teaching. I do everything project-based. Um, if they take a test, what do students do? They will memorize what they need to, come in, spit out the information on your test, and promptly forget it. Why? Because I've not shown them any value other than rote memorization and pass the test and get the grade. The effective domain, and I think a lot of this can be built in when you do projects, they now apply this into their own life, they evaluate this, they're analyzing, they're synthesizing at a higher level, and now they begin to see where and how all of this comes into play. They receive the information, they're responding, they're valuing this information, which becomes important. They start to organize this in their own venue, in their own way to do things, and they ultimately are going to characterize this in such a way that it makes sense to them and they see where uh, where it is changing their own behavior and where it's going to apply. So building these things in, I think, are vital. And I think they're important as far as the objectives go. And again, developing objectives in all three of these areas now start to show you where and how and what kind of things you need to teach. It helps you to be more complete. Now, within each one of those lists that I just gave you in the breakout, there are a series and set of measurable terms. Okay, uh, Those are important, and I'll refer back to those. And then on the latter side of that, there's it's not a great handout as far as a type. I should probably retype this, but there's some great information on here. There's some very strong words that you can use. There's creative behaviors. There's, complex, there's a lot of measurable words that we're going to talk about. So I would tell you just to keep hold of this because it's a, it's a pretty decent uh, handout and kind of kind of help you as a tool as you're starting to write objectives. So let's go back into this and 
kind of talk a little bit more. Questions about Bloom's taxonomy as we're kind of moving into this. Anybody have any questions on anything within the cognitive, the psychomotor, or the affective domains? They're fairly straightforward, except the, the, the affective domain can be a little nebulous because it's not as measurable. It's how, do you, how can you tell when somebody's really valuing something? And they say, oh, I really value it. Well, you're not really sure. You know, those are things that you kind of have to measure and you have to look at. And you can't write a test question that measures whether somebody values something. It's more of an observable thing. So it's, it's, it's a little more nebulous. It's, it's a little more vague as far as how you, how you measure that. So let's talk a little bit about where these behavioral objectives fit and how this all fits in with Bloom's taxonomy. First of all, behavioral objectives do several things. They tell you, the instructor, what you're planning for. In other words, from an instructional design point of view, but also from how you evaluate, as we kind of said before. I think it helps in you developing a lesson plan. In other words, what it is that you wish to accomplish and what you teach. Every one of us do that, whether you put it in whatever form. You put it in your own form. You put it in some type of a, a lesson plan format that we teach teachers how to do. It's irrelevant, but you have a plan of attack I do this in every class that I have. I have a lesson plan. I have my own format on how I do it. But it is highly structured in what I'm going to accomplish and how each one of my objectives are aligned. And that's important because what we're looking to do is take those behavioral objectives and operationalize those into a lesson plan that we're going to deliver. And the lesson planning is nothing more than just us pre-thinking and pre-planning for how we're going to execute in front of a group of students whether that's on online, face-to-face, -face, or through some type of a synchronous kind of a communication. What we want to do is we want to be prepared and make sure that we're just not going off on a tangent, but that we are really focused on meeting those objectives. The other thing that behavioral objectives do, they tell the student what is expected of them, what they have to do. So that tells us that we need to post those. One of the things that RMUO does is they request that you know we establish objectives. They have a very nice scope and sequence that they've put together to assist faculty to kind of outline. They call it a course map. And that course mapping does all of this. But in telling the student what's expected of them, that means you have to post your objectives. Um, there are some teachers when they K through 12 and some uh, instructors in higher education that will post those objectives on a board. In other words, if you're teaching in a face-to-face -face setting, they'll put the objectives on the side board and let the students know exactly where they're coming. Now, some will put them in behavioral objective format, some won't, some will just put them in a generic form, but every way you look at it, you are telling the student what they're gonna learn for that day. And that's part of the process of learning. If students understand what they're gonna learn, then they're gonna be more aptly uh, to learn it and they're gonna be more able to apply it if they understand where things are coming from and where they're going. All right, there are some rules for writing objectives. And as I was talking about with Donna early on, you know, there used to be three and then there was a fourth. We've added a fifth in here and I'll tell you which it is. First, the objectives must be written for the student. You don't want to write them for instructor behavior. You want to write them from the perspective of what the student is going to be like at the end of that particular lesson. So it has to be student-centric, not instructor-centered. It's not about what you're going to do. It's about what they're going to be like. So it's that's why we call them behavioral objectives, because we're looking to change the student's behavior whatever level, whether it's kindergarten, first grade, high school, college, doctoral and graduate, we still are working with the student and what they're going to be able to learn. Okay. Second thing, they have to be measurable. Now, the list that I gave you on that Bloom's taxonomy handout has a whole bunch of measurable words. Why measurable? Because that helps us to know whether the student has met it or they haven't met it whether we do that as a formative evaluation or we do that as a summative through an exam or a project. So we have to have measurable terms because then that makes them clear and it lets us know what's going on. The third thing is the one we added in here a couple of years ago because we found that students were, when they were writing behavioral objectives, sorry, I must have the timer on this thing. 
when they were writing behavioral objectives, they weren't being specific. They were being very vague with that. And therefore, when it came time for them to develop instructional strategies from it, they weren't sure what to do. So they kind of abandoned the objectives and the objectives and what was being taught really had no connection. And this is what we generally find that if your objectives are not written in a correct way or written properly, then what happens is they just don't become usable. And people will just say, okay, well, I wrote my behavioral objectives, and but here's what I'm going to really teach. If your objectives are written properly, then there is a connection. If they're not written well, then there's a disconnect. Okay. So we ask that they be written clearly and very specific so as to be usable. The next thing is they're requiring what we call a, a condition. We have to include conditions of performance. That's what we're going to give or withhold from the students. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It also has to state standards of acceptable performance. That is such things as things that we're going to be able to measure. Time, quantity, quality. How well does somebody have to do something? Do they have to be able to do something within a period of time? In other words, you give them, they have to do this within five minutes. They have to uh, develop so many things or they have to do something at a certain quality. Now, those standards are developed based upon how they're going to be utilized. When we start talking about objective writing rules, the first one, written for the student. If you start out every objective with at the end of the lesson, the student will be able to, and we always use the abbreviation TSWBAT. If you do it that way, then it automatically flows that the next part of the sentence adds to what the student will do. So at the end of the lesson, the student will be able to define the term Java. Okay, That's an objective, and it's written for the student. So I know if I have to, if the student has to define Java, then I have to give them a definition of that. How I do that, maybe I throw the definition on a slide. Maybe I write it on a board. Maybe I re have them read it out of a book. Maybe I have them discuss it. Those are instructional strategies that fall out simply from that. The wrong way is to state it as the instructor will give the students a list or the instructor will. That's instructor behavior. You want to define student behavior. So start every objective with at the end of the lesson the student will be able to. And basically what I do is I put TWSBAT at the top and then my objectives just finish that. It's just a simpler, quicker way to do it. How you choose, that's up to you. The second rule is they have to be measurable. Objectives need to be measurable. It should ask yourself, what is the learner doing when he is demonstrating that he has achieved this particular objective? So an example, the statement to develop a critical understanding of the operation of a cardiac monitor, for example, could read at the end of the lesson, given a monitor, the student will be able to accurately identify by name each of the controls located on a life pack. Okay, that is very, very specific. Um, it is measurable. What's the measurable term in there? What's the measurable term in that objective? Name. Name of each of the controls. Name each of the controls or identify by name each of the controls. And that is the measurable term. That's the measurable word. You want them to be able to identify. You want them to be able to name. Okay, there's actually two in that one. All right. Again, the objective must be written in behavioral terms, must use words like identify or describe, define, solve, compare, list. The word understand, I want the student to be able to understand. How do you measure their understanding? I'm not sure you can. In fact, that's a really nebulous word. The conclave of educators in 2001 uh, said, okay, everybody likes to use the word uh, understand, so we'll make that a measurable word. Well, it really isn't. If you tell me I'm going to, the student will be able to understand the term uh, whatever, Java, that doesn't tell me anything. How do you measure their understanding? It really is a, a non-measurable word, if you will. It's a non-behavioral word. Things like enjoy or really understand or the student will believe, you, don't, you can't measure those things. They're not tangible. Now that starts to get into the effective domain, which is a whole different thing. 
But when you're talking about strict measurable terminology, you need to stay over here with the more tangible terms. Okay. All right, so they have to be measurable. Objective has to be clearly stated and specific to be usable. Okay. The term, the student will be able to define the key terms. That's too vague. You can say, well, I know what the key terms are. Yeah, you do, but write them down. And that's where your objectives become finite. Your objectives should be clear enough that when you hand them to somebody else who has the same body of knowledge and skills that you do, that they understand what those objectives are. If you say to, the, to hand this to another instructor, the student will be able to define the key terms, and you hand that to me and I have the same body of knowledge, I'm going to say, well, what are those key terms? So you need to be specific. This is a simple idea, but you'd be surprised how many people just keep their terminology or keep their objectives vague. Such thing as the student will be able to accurately define asset, liabilities, owner, equity, given a balance sheet, is specific and clearly stated so that I know exactly what the terms are and what is being done here, what's being conducted. So that's the important part of that. So keep your objectives clearly stated and they must be specific. That's one that we've added that's really not in the literature, but I think it's, it's important as we've seen students, our students write objectives, they just, they, they're not as clear. The next is something called conditions of performance. Now, your objectives must specify conditions of performance under which the student is going to display the behavior. In other words, it's what you are going to give the student or what you are going to withhold from them. It really does help to define the conditions in the learning experience, and it further defines that behavior of what you're looking for. So a change in the condition may change the behavior. Um, example, if you are having a student solve certain math problems, like the example at the bottom, given a calculator, a student will be able to solve quadratic equations. Without a calculator, the student will be able to solve quadratic equations. Those are two different skill sets. So it's what you're going to give them or what you're going to withhold from them that will help to define. In other words, somebody having a calculator, well, that's a different skill set. Somebody working without a calculator, that's yet a different skill set as well. And there are times that I'm going to want one over the other. You have very, very specific goals within your program of things that you're going to give them or withhold from them. And they define different behaviors. Think of this, you ask the question of yourself, what will the student be given or what will be withheld from them? In other words, you have to have, if you're going to have them, um, you know, develop a, a computer program of some kind, whether it's Java, COBOL, whatever it happens to be, um, you want them, they have to be able to have access to software. They have to have access to a computer. They have to have access to a mainframe. Whatever it is that they have to have and that you have to give them access to, then that gets built in. If you understand that and build that in, then when you develop your instructional strategies, that also helps you to know what you have to provide them, what you have to do, and what you have to set up. Um, you also have to ask yourself a couple of questions. Are there behaviors that you are specifically trying to avoid? And do your objectives address this? In other words, are there certain things that you don't, certain habits that you know students will automatically uh, default to that you want to avoid. Build those kind of things in as well. Next, we have, we build in what's called standards of acceptable performance. This is how well the student must perform. It's based upon time, quantity, and quality. Um, you know, it may be in the old days where we were doing typing. Uh, maybe I write an objective. The student will be able to type 60 words a minute for five minutes with uh, two or less errors. That, in essence, deals with time, deals with quantity, deals with quality. Now, not every objective will have all three of those, but you will have certain things. Um, you know, patient immobilization to cause minimal movement. That's something that looks at quality. In other words, if I was a nursing student doing those kind of things. You have to look at the quantity and the time and the quality and see if those fit into a specific objective. Not all will, but it tells you how well they have to be able to do something. A lot of times you'll be dealing with objectives that look at a standard and say, well, you want the student to be able to accurately, and that's good. Or you say with 100% accuracy. Um, you know, sometimes those are implied. 
you know, think about it. If you're asking a student to define a term, define the term Java, uh, you know, do you want them to get the, do you want to get it half right? Do you want it to get it all right? It's either right or it's wrong. And there are certain things that are, you do accurately or do with 100%. You can write that in or it just becomes assumed. But if there are terms that specifically address acceptable performance, uh, you do it. In other words, you want them to do something correctly 86% of the time. What I would also tell you is don't arbitrarily make those up. If those are industry standards or those are program standards that you've all agreed upon, then you build those in. If they're not, then I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. All right, so again, they have to be written for the student. They have to be measurable. They have to be clearly stated and specific. They must include conditions of performance, which is given or withheld, and they have to have standards of acceptable performance. That's how well you want somebody to be able to do something. Those further define what we are looking for from our students when they leave our course. Now, some examples here just to throw out. Cognitive. Uh, the student, and you notice this is generally how I write my objectives, although I will divide them up by cognitive, psychomotor, and object, or, uh, cognitive, psychomotor, and effective domains just to keep it clean for me in a lesson plan. The student will be able to accurately define iambic pentameter given verse and verse drama examples. Okay. At what's the, let's, let's look at it this way. First of all, is that written for the student? Yep, starts out with the student will be able to. What is the measurable word in here? What's the measurable word? Define. Absolutely. The measurable word here is define. Okay. Is it written specifically? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Um, what is the conditions of performance? Accurately. Now that's the measurable, that is the verse, standard. Verse and verse drama examples. Right, we're giving them verse and verse drama examples. So that is the condition of performance. The standard of performance is the term accurately. So we are asking, some people would say 100% accuracy, that's fine. Uh, but the, the term accurately defined ambic pentameter continue, has all five of those within a cognitive domain. So let's take a, take a look at a psychomotor example. The student will be able to demonstrate the proper steps and procedures for using a microscope, given slides, an electric microscope with 100% accuracy. Again, what's the measurable term there? Demonstrate. De demonstrate. Very simply, the student will have to demonstrate something. So what does that tell you? That means that in order to assess that, you have to see them do this. Could you measure their ability to utilize a microscope using an exam? Could you ask them a multiple choice question that tells you that they can use a microscope? I get not, I guess you could, you know, it would be like a flow chart in a computer program, I guess. I mean, well, but I mean, you could, but it'd be difficult to do. But it, I, you, I would probably argue, Paul, that, you know, if I wrote the objective that the student will be able to list the proper steps and yeah, procedures maybe. in the microscope, then yeah, I would put that on a, a multiple choice test or I would put on an exam and say, list the steps and procedures for utilizing yeah. the microscope. You would write out the five steps. But that doesn't tell me they can physically do it. So those are two different things. It's one well, thing you know, to write if, you, if you're going to look at something like this, demonstrate the proper steps, psychomotor domain. Well, if you're 100% online and well, I mean, it didn't say this is not a challenge for the online, but you're and talking you're not about synchronous, a, a, you know, see what I mean? If you're not, you can't see them. Well, there are certain things like this is a physical skill, and this is one of the limitations of online teaching. You don't, well, you would a hundred percent, a hundred percent, not a blended, a blended, you could right. do it. Oh, blended, but, you could do it. If you have a residency where the students are standing in front yeah. of you, then you have to, basically what this objective is telling you is that you have to see them do this. Yeah. So whether that's done through, you know, like a Google Hangout where they got a microscope in front of them and they're doing it, okay, that's not maybe the best way, but it's at least something you could do. But yeah. Or a there, simulation there, of some sort. You can have a simulation. Yeah, where maybe a simulation. Yeah, I guess you can. Yeah. You could develop some kind of a simulation for physical skills. 
Um, there are certain things within computer programming they have to have the skill, but you can look at the end product to see that they get there. Um, those are the kind of things that you kind of have to think about. If I need to have them demonstrate the proper steps, if I, in other words, at the end of this lesson, I want to make sure that they can use a microscope or use whatever computer or whatever physical element. I need to see them do it. So I want them to demonstrate that. Just having them list things or having them describe the process doesn't truly help me to measure what they're doing. The measurable word is they have to demonstrate. So that tells me I need to see them do it from an assessment point of view. Go back to the objective. The objective drives the instructional strategy. The objective also drives the assessment tools. So in teaching them this, one of the things we'll talk about next week is how do you teach this? Well, I would obviously have to demonstrate this to them. And then I would have to allow them a certain level of practice and then it would have them allow even more practice, and then I would have to have them demonstrate it in front of me. That's how I would teach this. That's how I would evaluate it. Very, very simple, but again, a properly worded objective allows you to define those things and just logically falls out how you'll teach it and how you measure it or assess it. The next one, type 40 words per minute, five minutes with less than three errors given a time test, typing test. That's an old objective. That's one Donna and I would have used years ago. Uh, when we were teaching keyboarding and things of that nature, but that's a psychomotor skill that involves um, under the standards of acceptable performance. It, it develops quantity, quality, and time. Um, the fourth objective I've got there is an example. Effectively differentiate between the reasons for the North and South entering the Civil War. Okay, this is now, you could consider this to be the higher order thinking on a cognitive where they were analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating but this is also one that you could, through differentiation, could work with the effective domain. The effective domain will cross over in some, and you'll start to say, well, I'm not really sure whether that's a cognitive, higher order thinking objective like evaluate, or is it effective domain? They will cross over, but the idea is you build in things that show the students where and how they're going to use things, where they're, how they're going to apply certain things or what they mean in their own life. It's a little more difficult, but it can be done. Okay. okay I have a question. Certainly. All right. In terms of objectives, are there differences across undergrad to doctoral? And does a doctoral program have a higher level or should there be higher level learning objectives and behavioral outcomes than at an undergrad? Or is it the content that's driving it? I think you're you're correct. You automatically assume that PhDs have or dealing with higher order thinking than uh, undergraduates or graduates for that matter. And I think there's a progression up. There naturally is. Um, I think that's why at the PhD level, in fact, in our program, I can tell you in the program I took, uh, when, th when I went through Penn State, I had in all the coursework I ever took, I had one exam and it was a quiz in the middle and that was it. Everything else was project-based, which dealt with more of the higher order thinking. It was always a paper, there was always a project, there was always something that I was doing that was more of what I would consider to be an authentic experience. Um, I think a lot of times in certain undergraduate classes, you may look that there are, there are probably more lower order thinking, but I would probably argue that, you know, that's important. And there's probably some of that that is absolutely required in doctoral courses. Um, when you start addressing people with quantitative, qualitative research or start dealing with statistics, there's some foundational type of things that deal with some baseline. You know, you go to the lower order thinking on the cognitive domain, but then the idea is to move them up more quickly into higher order thinking. I just automatically assume that somebody gaining a PhD is looking at things more from a critical lens. So there, you, you're moving them more quickly, I believe, into the analysis, into the synthesis, um, and into the evaluation part of the cognitive domain. If there are skills involved, you're trying to move them. You might argue that one of the big skills that you teach out of a PhD is the idea of, of how a student will be able to conduct research quantitatively, qualitatively, you know, apply and analyze statistics. Um, I would argue that that's higher order thinking. You need to start with low, but you need to move them, you need to give them the baseline but move them up on that contingency where the cognitive and the psychomotor work together so that they can develop the whole picture and apply that. 
And I think the effective domain comes in, and I'll be honest with you, I think the effective domain comes in far later because I think most doctoral students that we have seen over the years, they're doing what they're told to do and they don't always understand exactly why they're doing something. Why am I doing this qualitatively? Why am I doing this quantitatively? Why do I have to do this for the IRB? Why do I have to do that? And they're going through the steps and procedures and it's one of those things, and, and maybe you can tell me you felt the same way. When I graduated from my doctoral program at Penn State, I remember graduating thinking, oh, good Lord, I'm supposed to be a doctor now, and I don't know that I know anything. And it was a little scary because I'm out there and I'm going, okay, I'm supposed to have this degree after my name and know something, and I don't know that I do. And I remember I was sitting in a meeting about three, four months later, and I started to expound on something. And I'm thinking, well, holy crap, where did I know that? Well, I knew that because of the program and the fact that I had done these things. And now I was starting to see where all of that stuff that I had learned was now starting to apply. And that's part of the skill set and the development. And I'm of the belief that we are setting seeds. We're putting things in place. Uh, we're teaching people how to do things that they may not see application for till down the road. Um, and, and I think that's part of it. And I wish I could say that every objective can be met 100% into the highest level on Bloom's by the end of our course. I'm just not sure that that's realistic. Uh, I think we put things in motion. We put things there. And that's part of your expertise as subject matter experts to know what the student needs to know and how they got there. Questions up for me on anything else with the objectives. Now, it's 11 o'clock. Um, what I had planned to do, but I ended up talking a little bit longer than I wanted to, but hey, happens. Um, what I would probably ask you is this. Take a look, and if you want to, I will stay online. We'll continue this a bit. But I would ask you to write, take a look at the course that you are planning to teach. Okay, take a look at the courses that you are planning to teach. And I want you to pick one lesson out of that. And I would ask you to go in and write a behavioral objective for each one of those areas, cognitive, psychomotor, and effective domains. When you do that, keep the five rules, if you would, in front of you. It has to be written for the student. Must be measurable. Has to be specific. Has to include conditions of performance, what you're going to give them or withhold. And it has to have standards of acceptable performance. So if you would, just take a minute, and I would tell you to type it on your computer if you could, and then we'll just ask everybody to share, or anybody wants to share, and we'll kind of beat up a couple of objectives if you don't mind. And that may help you to understand and get a little practice on how you can properly format those objectives. So I'm going to stop presenting and give everybody a couple of minutes um, to write a couple of objectives. And anybody wants to, we'll share those back and forth for a couple of minutes if you've got the time and just help you along the way. So please go ahead, take a couple of minutes and write some objectives and then we'll see where we're at. Rick, I have one concern that I've seen relevant before is that the program objectives are assumed to be well done. That's almost never the case. True. Uh, and, and so there's got to be an agile reflection of how this changes as we do stuff. Um, you bring up a very, very valid point. And a lot of people believe the curriculum is static. Uh, I'm not of that belief. And I, I'm also not believe it is is completely fluid um, because then you lose program goals and people go off on their tangents. There has to be some middle ground, I think. But I absolutely agree with you. I think program goals, in other words, your highest level of what you want your students to leave, I think they have to change. They have to grow with the times. Uh, we found that. Um, you know, over the years, we have found that we've had to change certain things out because, one, they didn't meet the student population that was coming to us or two things had changed within the profession, and we just needed to upgrade where we were. Now, there are certain things that are just static. I mean, statistics is statistics. Maybe how we teach it, other things that we're doing. Um, 
but it's it's you know things are changeable and i think we one of the things dave and i would i would agree with you they're more fluid but this is why in order to be able to change those in a logical way you have to have program goals and you have to divide that into course goals. you have to be able to court clearly see that through course mapping to know and i think you need to review that every period of time whatever that is i don't know we kind of take a look at things on a yearly basis you know are okay are our courses still aligned are they still good do we need to change things we don't change things drastically but we have over the years we've changed certain courses I said, okay, this course is too much like this course, or these things have merged together, or we need to have our students that are coming to us need to have this, and we will morph things out and change them. We've done that over the years. So the, the program, and I'm a, I can only go by my example. I'm not saying that we're the, the epitome of it. I'm just telling you what we do. But I think in order to be able to change those appropriately, Dave, you have to have and you have to work toward good program goals. And I agree with you. Sometimes those are written in isolation. Uh, those are written, you know, with not a whole lot of thought that goes into them because, yeah, okay, we got to write program goals and this is what we're going to do, but we already know what we're doing. The key is to drill it back from what you as a subject matter expert know in teaching your class, how does that relate up? In other words, through your course level objectives, through your program level objectives. Um, if you can start with a very strong set of program goals, then your course level goals are a little easier and then that helps to further define your uh, your course or your lesson plan objectives does that make sense to you dave does that make sense what i'm saying yeah it, it does i mean one of my thoughts it, long ago i used to teach statistics and i would always teach stat two assuming you haven't had stat one because no one ever remembered anything from stat one good point Part of the problem was the goals were totally unrealizable for the level of student we had. Uh, maybe I have also not particularly effective, but uh, some concepts are much more comp. We don't have the time. In other words, there's a constraint on what we can accomplish. And while it would be a good goal, it's not doable in the time frame the students are willing to allocate to it. That brings up another point. You know, when you set your program goals, you set your course level goals, you, you have to look at, and this is where you as the experts within each one of your subject areas know and kind of adjust when and how much students can absorb. You're, you're absolutely correct. And a lot of times that's what gets changed. You know, you look at a program and you evaluate, you know, we, we look at that. You're going to look at your outcomes. You're going to look at how the students perform. Um, you know, you start looking at the bigger picture and how they perform when they take all of those skills and apply that into a dissertation or a big project. You know, are they getting it? And if they're not, why aren't they getting it? You know, so you look at, this is one of the things that every university does. You look at outcomes, course level outcomes. You look at program level outcomes. You collect data from the students themselves as far as what they're reporting. They learned from what they didn't, what they need more. And you take all of those into consideration as far as looking back at your program goals, your course level goals, and your writing objectives. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's just, it's a whole picture of things, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, a lot of times, program goals are written as, yeah, 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 we got to write those, and you know, nobody really puts the thought into them if they need to. Okay, thanks. Okay, while I've been yapping, does anybody have a, uh, an objective that they would like to share? All right, I, I got one. Okay, why don't you go ahead and share it? Uh, do you know how to do that? I, I could just read it out. It's not that long. Okay. Uh, you want me to uh, type it on? Um, you want me to type it out on the chat? No, if you wrote it, just go ahead and read it. We'll see if we can absorb it that way. Uh, explain. I'm using explain, which is comprehension. Right. The uh, cognitive taxonomy. Explain data integration and the extraction, transformation, and load ETL process. This has to do with the data warehouse. Okay. So in other so words, it has to do with the data warehouse. So I want them to explain data integration. In other words, why 
is this important uh, in a data warehouse to extract transformation and load? Okay, very simply here, Paul, what's your measurable term? Uh, I guess, well, the, explain, wouldn't it be, no. The, yeah, I think you're right. Explain is your measurable term. It, 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 explain, yeah, which is comprehension, right? That's the second right. Bloom's thing, taxonomy, cognitive, right. whatever. Correct. So the student will be able to explain what is, um, yeah, it, 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 ETL, explain right. ETL. Okay. So that is your measurable term, all right? Um, what is your condition of performance? It is written for the student because the student will be able to identify. So that's that. Your measurable yeah, term. Well, I is guess I, I I don't really know. I, you know, I would just have them explain it and 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 indicate why it's important. So okay. measure it. I, I don't know. You know. I mean, well, I, I, for them to explain it, I mean, it could be done a couple of ways, Paul. I mean, you could simply have them, you know, maybe you do something in a discussion board where you say, okay, I want you to explain this process. And maybe you have them do it in a paper. Maybe you have them do it in a discussion board. Maybe you have them do it orally. Um, those are things. That would you be could it. it would be orally. It would be orally. Yeah. This would be, I would do this face-to-face, -face, though, probably. Right. Do and so you're doing it in board. But, Yeah. Yeah, you're doing this in a format where, um, you know, this is part of a teaching process and you could assess this formatively. In other words, while you're teaching that you can assess, are they getting it? And that prepares yeah. you for the next thing. You could also put that down on an exam if it was important enough to do and it was more of a summative type thing. And that's a call you'll make. Um, all right. What are you giving the student or withholding from them? Is there anything that you have to give them or withhold from them to be able to do that? Yeah, they'd have to know what a data warehouse is. Okay, so in other words, given examples of a data warehouse. Yeah, they would have that, yeah. But given okay. an example of, yeah, given an example of a data warehouse, or, the, or the, given an example of the data warehouse process. You know, okay. well, yeah, I guess you have, I, also yeah. Be you have to also be careful through here that you're not just providing within your objectives instructional strategies. You know, the instructional strategies will fall out. They don't need to be defined within your objective. So that's something of a difference with that. Um, okay, what is the standard of acceptable performance? Notice. Well, I guess I, I guess for them to actually explain, it, to extract, you know, actually explain it correctly, the transformation and the yeah. love. In yours, in yours is the way it's worded. <clears throat> it could very simply be uh, that you want them to accurately do it, or it's implied. In other words, when they explain it, they have to explain it accurately. Yes, you don't want yes. To so it's almost, and a lot of people will just, well, that's assumed. It's assumed that it's 100% yeah, accurate. Yeah, I guess I, I could have put that in accurately. You could have, but it's, it's, it's not a huge deal if you don't. Yeah. yeah. It's just one of those things you need to consider in there. You know that they have to do it the 100%. I mean, would you want somebody to explain something and know it 50%? You wouldn't. You yeah, know, yeah, you yeah. want them to do it with 100% accuracy. So good objective. It's got every all the key elements. Some of them are applied, but they're perfect. It's good. You know, it, Rich, this is kind of interesting. You know, my, my degree is from educational technology and communication. Yeah. But I did information science as a as a 30 credit thing. And we had all this. <laughs> oh, science. yeah, but it's been, a, been how many years? Yeah, I'll be so. like Bloom's taxonomy and the spiral curriculum and uh, subsummation. And this is really interesting that you're talking about this. And I haven't really thought about this for a long time since I've been in graduate school. And yeah, I think that's the, that's the going call. through blooms again was like, whoa, man, all kind of neurons in my brain were going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thinking about learning that stuff, you know, because I was from the School of Education, even though information science was in that school where I was. And that's what I did the computers, information science at Pitt. But it was interesting to hear you talk about you know, the effective domain and all that stuff. It brought back everything that I learned 40 years ago. It was interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is fascinating stuff. It truly yeah. is. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this yeah. point. Um, 